Welcome to another episode of the Understanding Crypto series by Thomas Plunkett. Today we're going to take a look at unexpected Ether attacks against smart contracts. Another of our short little videos taking a look at how to pre pre create better smart contracts that avoid uh, potential losses. Uh, this video and these slides are available under Creative Commons license. All right, so let's talk about unexpected Ether attacks. So typically when Ether is sent to a contract, that Ether uh, is either going to cause the fallback function or another payable function defined in the contract to be executed. However, there are some exceptions to this where Ether can be, uh, be sent to a contract without any code being executed by that contract. And so that if you define, design your contract to rely on code execution for all the Ether that comes in, then you could be vulnerable if someone sneaks some Ether into a contract when you're not expecting it. So, so let's take a look at what's going on, you know, so, you know, so yeah, it's not the case that always that Ether is going to come in and it will be directed to a payable function. Um, and because developers sometimes expect that, uh, that it's that the Ether that's coming in is going to a payable function, they can design their code. Um, in such a way that um, when Ether comes in without going through a payable function, the contract can fail. So first off, how do you send Ether to a contract without using a payable function? So I'm gonna go through and explain that, and then I'll show you some example attacks, and then I'll show you some ways to avoid those attacks. So first off, the easiest way to send Ether to a contract is using the self-destruct function or by mining and setting the contract address as the address that's gonna receive the Ether from the mining. In either case, that ether goes directly into the contract's balance. It doesn't go to a fallback function. It doesn't go to another function with the payable keyword. So if an attacker wants to attack a contract, probably the easiest way to do it, if, if this is one of these ether contract that's vulnerable to an unexpected ether attack, the easy way is just to, for the attacker to just create a contract, self-destruct that contract, and then ether will arrive at the target contract address upon self-destruct. Um, all right. So let's dive into this in a little more detail. So, you know, we've talked about the uh, self-destruct function previously, but uh, so this is a special function that you actually have to build into your smart contract. Uh, but any contract that implements that self-destruct function um, that then calls a self-destruct function, the result is the bytecode is removed from the contract address and all the ether that's stored in that contract is then sent to a parameter specified address that when you call self-destruct. And if that specified address is a contract, then that new contract doesn't have any functions get called. Uh, instead, the incoming ether is just added to the balance. And therefore, attackers can use a self-destruct function to send ether to any contract, regardless of any um, code that exists in that contract, even a contract that doesn't have any payable functions. Um, and so this is a mechanism by which attackers can add uh, unexpected ether to a contract by calling self-destruct. Another way to do it uh, is to preload the contract address for ether. Contract addresses are actually deterministic. Uh, the address is calculated from uh, the Keswick 256 hash of the address, creating the contract and the transaction nonce that uh, creates the contract. Um, so it's basically a hash of the address, creating the contract and the transaction nonce for that address. Um, and so if you know someone's going to create a contract uh, and you know what their transaction nonce is and their address is, you can go ahead and figure out what the newly created contracts hash is going to be ahead of time. And you can deposit Ether into that address. And then when the address is the contract is created, uh, it will already have this pre-existing ether in there. Um, and again, this pre-existing ether will have completely skipped going through a payable function uh, of any type. It's just been pre-put in there. All right, so we've talked about how you can put ether into a contract without calling a payable function. Now let's take a look at an example of how this could go, how uh, this attack would actually work. So here we've got a little uh, game 
uh, where players send half an ether to a contract in the hope of being a player that reaches one of three milestones. Uh, the first player to reach three ether, five ether, or 10 ether. And um, when you are the first player to reach e three ether, you get a redeemable amount of ether of two ether. When you're the first player to reach five, you get a redeemable ether of three ether. And when you're the first player to reach 10, you get a redeemable ether of five ether. Um, and since we're going to 10, um, that's, you know, it adds up to three and five to be a total of 10. So this contract is intended to pay out exactly the amount of ether it receives uh, from the players. And each player is on each play is contributing 0.5 ether. And basically it's sort of like a racing thing where, you know, you, you're trying to be the first person to three or five or 10. So, and you wanna be the person who adds up and you're hoping that your incoming transaction is gonna be the one that's accepted. So your play counts as equaling three. And the other players are also sending in transactions simultaneously. And they're hoping that their uh, play will be the one that'll add up to three or five or 10. Uh, but what can an attacker do to mess this game up? Would an attacker, so this, uh, how this contract works is it's actually checking um, this variable current balance. And this variable current balance is this dot balance plus message value. So balance, this dot balance is actually the balance of the contract. Um, so if the contract is only received ether through this function play, which is payable, then um, hopefully in each time it's only getting 0.5 ether as a message. Um, so if the message value is something other 0.5 ether, it just rejects it at the require, then in theory, um, you know, if you add a bunch of half ethers, you should end up with 10 or three or five or 10. Uh, the problem is, is if someone sneaks in uh, some amount of ether that is not a 0.5. Um, so for, or, you know, some multiple 0.5. So for example, what if the attacker sends in a 0.1 ether using the self-destruct mechanism that we talked about earlier. Um, and now your balance in here is 0.6 or 3.1 or 5.1 or 10.1. Then if you're off just by a little bit, you won't be exactly three, you won't be exactly five, and you won't be exactly 10. And this game won't work. Instead, nobody will get paid. Um, and so uh, this contract essentially becomes stuck until someone else self-destructs a contract to send in enough ether so that our balance becomes, again, a multiple 0.5 and it can pay out. And of course, if the balance goes over 10 ether, this require statement would fail and then it would never be able to pay out. Um, so that's the problem. If you're relying on the this dot balance, you could run into problems because an attacker can manipulate what the this dot balance is so it never exactly each is, hits these numbers. So basically the way to fix this is to avoid the this dot balance. Don't, when you're writing your program, your contract logic should not depend on the balance of the contract. Instead, create your own variables that are tracking what's supposed to be going on in the function. And those variables will then uh, be able to safely track the deposit of ether. And if a hacker goes and adds some additional ether, nothing will go wrong in your code. Your logic will be fine. So this game on the previous slide is easily fixed. If we just change this, uh, this dot balance here and make it something like another uh, var variable, um, say for example, uh, deposited ETH or something like that. Um, and then we just keep track of that balance and that balance is always gonna be fractions of 0.5 or multiples of 0.5. And so all our if else if loop here will work perfectly. So this has been a uh, short little very video taking a look at the problem of unexpected ether attacks against smart contracts. Uh, tune in next time when I'll dive into some additional uh, anti-patterns for smart contracts and ways in which to prevent uh, hackers from being able to attain your ether.